Jake Berkey bringing you another Rock Rods Tech Tip video on how to build a four link suspension. Today we're going to focus on anti squat numbers and anti dive numbers. Chances are, if you're building a four link suspension, you've already gotten to the point where you've seen this, this terminology come up and you've done some research. Um, if you were brave enough and you asked on Pirate, more than likely you've got 15 comments of people flaming you because you don't know what you're talking about. It's nonsense. I'm here to help you guys, so I'm going to try to explain the concepts and teach you guys how to calculate anti-squat, and hopefully it'll help you guys out in the future. So what is anti-squat? How do you calculate it? Let's start off with how to calculate it. Um, you take a point from your axle, a point from your chassis where your upper forelink and lower forelink bars are going to be. You project those two points out and where they meet theoretically in space is going to be what's called the instant center. The shorter your instant center is, the higher your anti-squat, the farther away it is, the lower your anti-squat. And you change that by changing the link separation at the chassis. Once you know what your instant center is, then you take the contact patch of the tire and you run a straight line from the contact patch through the instant center and where it meets up with your center of gravity is going to be what your anti-squat values are. If you want to know how to do it the long way, do a Google search or go on to YouTube and type in how to calculate anti-squat. There's a guy who has a YouTube channel called Engineering Explained and he teaches you how to do that the long way and it's actually really cool. So um, I'm not here to do that though. I'm here to teach you how to do it the easy way because frankly I'm lazy and I like to do things the easiest way. I don't want to waste your time. There's no reason to waste anybody's time. There's a calculator that does it. It's fantastic. It's called T-R-I-A-G-E-D. A uh, guy has developed a Excel spreadsheet. All you have to do is plug your numbers in and it's going to spit out what your anti-squat is. Um, you're going to need to know your chassis weight, you're going to need to know your unsprung weight from your axles, you're going to need to know your tire diameter, your wheelbase, and your center of gravity. Um, to get your center of gravity, we'll talk about that real quick because all the other stuff I think that is it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, basically what you need to do is you need to take the top bell housing bolt from where the motor and transmission bolt together. That top bell housing bolt is going to be your center of gravity. If you have cast iron heads and aluminum intake and kind of an old school block. If you have a newer block and you have aluminum heads or aluminum block and a plastic intake, that center of gravity is going to be a lot lower. So what they suggest to do or what I suggest to do is take the camshaft center line and where it meets the back of the block and the transmission bolt together, that's going to be the point. So it's going to be a little bit lower because you have less weight up high. Now obviously these are some guesstimations because if you have an LS motor and you've got a 20 jerry cans strapped to the top of your rig and a bunch of tools up there, your center of gravity is a lot higher. Um, so this is just a guesstimation. But once you have all those numbers and you plug them into the four link calculator, you're going to have to plot out your upper and four link mounts where they go from the axle to the frame and you get all those points. It's going to spit out your anti-squat value. Your anti-squat value is something that's going to dictate the way the chassis uh, hits bumps uh, at speed and the way that it launches. So let's talk about what anti-squat is. Um, the, the number one example that I can think of is uh, drag racing because they rely a ton on anti-squat to show you um, uh, what I'm talking about. Go on and look at a couple of videos of drag racers. You're going to see some drag racers that stomp the gas and they pop a huge wheelie. That's going to be a very high anti-squat value. Uh, the ones that just barely come off the ground and shoot off into space, that's a little bit lower anti-squat value. Now, anti-squat is based on the four length's ability to transfer the, the traction of the tires through the chassis. What I mean by that is, as the tire is moving forward, the axle is trying to go the opposite direction. In the rear, that means the axle is trying to rotate upwards or the pinion is trying to rotate upwards. It's pushing on the lower link bar, it's pulling on the upper link bar, and that push and pull is trying to lift the chassis. So when you're at a dead stop and you stomp the gas, the vehicle's weight is going to try to go backwards and the ability for the four link to stop that from happening is what your anti-squat is. If you have 100%, it's going to completely counteract, you're going to stay level and shoot off. If it has a high number, it's going to try to lift the chassis and what that's doing is it's shoving a bunch of traction down to the ground and resisting the chassis uh, momentum from being pushed backwards into the springs. If you have a low anti-squat value, when you stomp the gas, 
the chassis is going to go backwards and some of the force is going to go into the springs. You're going to see the rear end uh, and the chassis become closer together. It's going to squat. That's why it's called anti-squat. The higher the number, the more it resists squatting, hence anti-squat. So where does this apply in the off-roading business? Well, if you're a rock bouncer or you're trying to climb a ledge and it's slick and nasty, when you stomp the gas, you want as much weight to go into the tires as possible from the transition of moving still to going forward. But there's trade-offs of that. What happens when you are, once you get your momentum going and you contact the rock ledge, we're gonna give a couple examples on what happens in that scenario by using a trophy truck or an ultra four car going through the desert as well as a rock buggy hitting a ledge once you get the front tires up and you try to hit that ledge. What happens is once the vehicle's speed reaches equilibrium and you're no longer trying to push the vehicle forward, basically your acceleration rate is, is reduced and you just have a speed, the amount of force that's going through the forelink is greatly reduced until you hit an obstacle. Picture this, your tires hit a couple whoops or a rock ledge. They're going to contact the face of that rock ledge and in that split second, that tire is gonna get a ton of traction. That traction is going to try to climb the pinion up. It's gonna rotate the axle backwards, but it can't because you're forelink, so it's gonna push on the lower bar pull on the upper bar and throw a ton of force into the chassis. It's not tunable. You can't tune for that. So what people do is they lower their anti-squat value to make it so that they can tune for those scenarios. So if you're going fast through the desert, you're gonna want a low anti-squat value. If you're a rock bouncer, you might want a low anti-squat value when you hit the face, but you need a high anti-squat value to get you the momentum to hit the face. So what is the correct number? I can't tell you. You have to know and you have to figure it out by changing the relationship of your upper and lower link bars to what your personal preference is. But I can tell you this, if you have something that's going to see a lot of speed, you want a lower anti-squat value. In a mud truck, you'd probably want a high anti-squat value so that when you stomp the gas, it throws the tires down, gets a ton of traction, and you can shoot down through the mud drags. Um, if you're in a moon buggy, you might want a high anti-squat value because it's going to give you a ton of traction. But also if you're in a moon buggy and you're on a side hill and you start getting a bunch of traction sideways, the anti-squat squat's going to want to pick the vehicle up. It's going to want to unload the suspension and it could possibly tip you over. So you have to find a median between the launch and once you reach equilibrium and you hit an obstacle, okay? Another thing that you're, you've probably seen this before, if you ever see a vehicle that's on a flat ledge and it's burning the tires and it's just sitting still burning the tires, working back and forth, it looks beautiful. But have you ever seen one that when it gets on that same ledge and it starts getting traction and burning the tires, it starts hopping real bad? That's a high anti-squat value. And what's happening is the tires get traction they start to get that traction, it lifts up on the chassis, the chassis has less weight on the tires and it gets up in the air, it comes back down, it grabs traction and it does the process over and over again and it oscillates and you start getting that hop. It's a high anti-squat value. So now that we've discussed a few scenarios and we've talked about where you might want a high anti-squat and where you might want a low anti-squat, let's talk about the front suspension and how it works. The front suspension has something that's called anti-dive, okay? It's the exact same concept, but backwards. Because what happens is, is when you're going and you stomp on the brakes, the vehicle's weight is going to try to go forward over the front axle, and your forelink has the ability to counteract that. When you're building a forelink in the TRI, AGED, uh, tri-aged calculator, the, the suspension uh, that you build will either be the front or the rear, but the number that you get for anti-squat in the rear will be anti-squat. The number that you get in the front will be anti-dive, although it still says anti-squat. Um, that is the vehicle's ability to, to, to uh, eliminate the amount of weight transfer going over the front axle. So 
you might think that that's a great thing. If you're going down a steep hill and you're hitting the brakes, it'll keep that nose from diving too much, which is a good thing. Uh, if you're in a core truck and you're flying and you hit a couple bumps leading up to a nice hard turn, it's a bad thing because when you hit that, when you hit the brakes, it's going to take all that mechanical leverage, put it in through the chassis, and the chassis is going to stiffen up right before you get to that turn. It's going to be a really bumpy ride. Um, in a rock bouncer, um, if you have uh, these considerations under throttle, you have a complete opposite scenario. If you have a high anti-squat value in the front and you stomp the gas, what's going to happen is it's going to try to compress the springs in the front. It's going to try to squat because as the tire's moving forward, the pinion's moving downward, which is pulling on the lower bar and pushing on the upper bar. So it's going to try to keep the vehicle in a squat position. So what does that mean when you're trying to climb a hill? Well, it's a good thing because if you have a high anti-squat value and you start going up the hill as you're on the throttle, it's going to keep the nose down and keep it tight to the springs and keep you from trying to flip over backwards. But in that same scenario, the nose is down and you have a compression. When you hit a ledge, what's going to happen? It's going to try to compress the springs because of that instant traction you get when you hit the ledge you already don't have a lot of suspension travel because your front end's been kept down and you have the potential of bottoming out the suspension and doing a backflip or bucking the front end up. So again, what is the correct anti-squat value? There is no such thing. I can't teach you what is right. You have to know by changing your values and driving it. But obviously you can't build your four-link suspension every time you go out and drive it. So what do I suggest? I suggest you take your upper four link bars and where they meet the chassis, get a bracket that has a couple holes in it, three, four, five, whatever you think. Take that bar, put it in where you think your anti-squat value should be, take it out, drive it. Then change it and see how it reacts and see how it does differently. And once you figure out what anti-squat number that you like in your suspension, the next one that you build, you can use those numbers and, and basically target that. Or you can do the same thing that I was talking about. And if you change up different tracks, you can change those bars from different spots to be able to give you different results. So one other thing that I need to talk about, anti-squat changes the relationship of the pinion and your drive shafts and your U-joints through the articulation cycle. And what I've done is I've created a little model over here. It's a scale version and we're gonna go through and we're gonna cycle the suspension out and I'm gonna show you how link separation at the frame dictates the amount of pinion change through the cycle. So check this out. This is a scale version of a four link that I built uh, with some cardboard and some plastic. And uh, I wanna show you guys how the anti-squat value and also the length of your arms dictates the way the pinion rotates through the suspension cycle. So if you look at this situation, this setup, um, it's kind of familiar because that's actually what I recommended in the first video. This is a scale version of a Dana 60 high pinion cool. You've got uh, 10 inches of link separation um, at a 40 inch tall tire times 25% gives you 10 inches. Your upper bar is shorter than your lower bar and your lower bar is kicked up at seven degrees. Remember I said the maximum was gonna be 10. So this is at seven. Um, output shaft and you have your ride height and then this is gonna be your full droop. Let's drop it down and see what happens. You're sitting at seven degrees, okay? So that's our control. Let's see what happens when we increase the length of our upper bar only. We're not gonna change anything but the upper bar. And the reason I know that is because with the upper being flat and the lower having the seven degrees, it didn't change your anti-squat value. All you did was just lengthen. So we have the same anti-squat value and everything, but let's see what happens when we rotate down. Now you can see that the pinion is pointed higher you're at 12 degrees, so that's a five degree increase, which means that your suspension can go down farther without bottoming out the U-joints, and I see a lot of guys bottoming out U-joints on the trail. So that's a really easy trick and an easy way to be able to rotate your pinion up. Now, how does that relate to anti-squat? Well, let's take a look. 
we're going to do something drastic. We're going to make our anti-squat value extremely high. And um, we're going to take and pin it right here. If you remember from the lesson, the point at which these two converge is called your instant center. This particular instant center is right here. Uh, take the bottom of your tire contact patch, go through your instant center, and you'd have a crazy high anti-squat with this setup. So let's rotate it down. And what you notice is as you rotate this axle around, it's going to stay pointed relative to that point right there. So if at ride height, I was to take my pinion and point it directly at the output, right now it's pointed lower, but if it was pointed directly at the output, through the entire cycle, you would have that drive shaft pointed straight at the output and this angle wouldn't change. Let's see what happens when we increase our anti-squat. So we're gonna pull this off and we're gonna pin it higher because if you remember from our first lesson or our lesson today, that the theoretical point in which these two converge is your instant center and therefore your instant center would be way out there in this setup and your angle would be from the bottom of your tire through the instant center and you'd have a very, very low anti-squat value. But check out what happens. As we rotate the pinion or the axle down and we get to full droop, the pinion is now pointed at this six degree mark. So it's actually lower than that of what you had when you had the shorter upper in the and a little bit higher anti-squat. So what does that mean? That means that the lower number of anti-squat, the farther away your instant center is, the higher your link separation is going to be, and the more your pinion is going to drop downwards as your suspension droops. So keep that in mind when you're building a suspension because as the suspension goes through its cycle, you need to make sure that your U-joints are gonna handle what you're trying to do. The cool thing about the TRI AGED calculator is that it will show you how your pinion is moving through bump and droop on the calculator. So you can actually cycle the suspension to where it's maxed out and see if you have enough degrees to keep your U-joints from binding. Now, I hope you guys like this because it was kind of fun for me. I like doing this type of thing. So um, the way that I keep on doing this stuff is by getting ideas from you guys. So as always, put them in the comments down below. But one other thing that I need to ask you to do is go on Busted Knuckle and Rock Rods and like their pages on Facebook and uh, like this video. Share it to some of your friends and whatnot so we can get some of this awareness. Make sure you go on my Facebook page, Jake Berkey Riot Buggy, and like the page because this is where we're dumping all these videos. They're going to come out there first. Um, hopefully this is uh, uh, something that will help you out when you're building your four-link suspension. We're going to talk about a few more things, um, roll centers and things, and some extra videos coming up. So stay tuned and uh, hope to see you guys out on the trail. Yeah.